Hello, everyone. This is Andrew from Auto Off Topic. The coloring contest is back, and now it's been improved thanks to Frank Eck. The contest is simple. Complete one of the pages in any of three mediums. This includes electronic using any of the paint type programs, color pencil, marker, and or crayon, with one entry counted per medium per person. So each individual can have a total of three entries. There will also be two age groups, age 15 and below, and 16 on up. Links to the coloring book pages can be found on our Facebook page or the page for the coloring book contest. Facebook.com forward slash AOTP contest 2017. Electronic entries, including scanned entries, can be sent to us via email, autooftopic at gmail.com. Paper copies can be sent by snail mail to Auto Off Topic Podcast, P.O. Box 35, Georgetown, Mass. 01833. Note, all hard copies received will not be returned. Period. The contest runs through November 30th. The companies and owners groups donating prizes are Mitsubishi Motors North America, Adventure Driven Design, Force Performance, Palladian Trucks, Northeast Mitsubishi 4x4, Mitsubishi Montero Owners Group USA, Florida Mitsubishi 4x4, and Mitsu Nation. All right, on to the show. And we're recording. Welcome to episode 43 of Auto Off Topic. I'm, I was looking for, for you know, uh, a confirmation that I was correct because I screwed up last episode. So this is episode 43. Yes. Welcome to episode 43 of Auto Off Topic. Yep. I am one of your every week hosts, Brad. And I'm your other host, Andrew. Hello, Andrew. So tell the fine people at home what our new theme song is again. Our new theme song is uh, Z28 by the band Z28. Um, the bassist of the band Z28 is a good friend of the show. Mm-hmm. Um, and he has asked us to, or I didn't ask us, we had a discussion about using his original song to, for the show because the show has a car theme and the song has a car theme. So, and it's a really cool song. And it's a really cool song on top of it and they're a really good band and if you like uh, I think I discussed it last episode if you like bands like Caius or um, Fu Manchu but maybe a little bit heavier than Fu Manchu um, check out Z28 the band um, on Bandcamp. Yes, Bandcamp. Or what is their Facebook um Facebook group name. I think you said it was Nobody Rides for Free. Should be Nobody Rides for Free. Yeah. I'm going to search it double, double check that right now. But yeah, Z28 is a cool local band to us. One of our friends is in the band. We're a little bit biased, but on top of it, they're actually really, really good. We saw them live uh, about a week ago, and it was an amazing show. So check them out. Give them a follow. If you see them playing a local show, they play a lot of shows in uh, the North Shore and in the Boston area. Um, but yeah, if you, if you see them playing live, check them out. You're not going to have a bad time. They're a really good show and they're a really good technical band and they have some, they have really good sound. Really, just a really good hard rock band. Uh, it's, they are at Nobody Rides for Free on, uh, Facebook, but it's Z28. Okay. So it's and, like uh, facebook.com slash Nobody Rides for Free. Yeah, it should be. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So that's where you find them. But, uh, do you tell a favor? Give them a listen. They're pretty cool, and uh, they'd appreciate it. And we certainly appreciate them allowing us to use their uh, song as our quote-unquote theme song. And actually, we will have an episode in the future, which we chatted about, where we're going to go to their studio and record an episode there with them and interview them about you know where the name Z28 came from and everything. Yes. Um, and they're going to play live on the show. So that's really, really going to be kind of cool, I think. So looking forward to that. So, Andrew, what do you got going on this week? Let's see. Oh, we do actually have some corrections. Yes, we do. So Ryan Dunham, who is at Rally Sideways on Instagram, was co-driving for the MAP Rally team during NEFR. So he wanted to give us the lowdown on the 80-mile-per-hour average speed rule. That's when we had a discussion with Jordan about, because they were talking about when, um, yeah, what's his name? The David Super, Higgins? David Higgins, yeah. David Higgins and Travis Pastrana on the yep. first stage of NEFR. David Higgins was complaining because he drove slow on purpose. <laughs> yeah, so what happens, he didn't, well, I guess he didn't drive slow. He drove to the 
what he thought would be the minimum or fastest time possible. So kind so, of like in a TSD, you have like a breakout time pretty much. Well, no. Like a TSD would be like scoring zero. It would be like the perfect. Yeah, that's what I mean. Not a breakout time. That's what I mean. You have to get, if you're faster or slower than this time, then you get penalized. Yeah. So it basically they're going for a perfect quotation score, which apparently wasn't uh, in effect. So the 80 mile per hour rule is apparently from insurance reasons. They don't want cars being too fast. Yeah, they don't need 150 on a residential street. Well, you uh, you <laughs> are right, but as a but the overall average for the total distance of the stage, if you're averaging above 80 miles an hour, that's really friggin' fast. Mm-hmm. Um, and they just, that's why they have chicanes. That's why they try to slow you down, and that's why they implemented this rule so that. Um, the very fast cars, if they... Will be penalized it, for going too fast. Well, they're not technically penalized. They're given the fastest time possible, which is the perfect score determined by the organizers. So Okay, so if they, if they waste car and car parts by trying too hard, then they're just going to get dialed back to whatever the fastest time allowed. Yeah, basically. Is. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, so that's, that's what it was. And then it wasn't in effect, so Pastrana went faster than... Yeah, by like 11 or 12 seconds yeah, or something like so. that. That's what that was. And then he also gave us the lowdown. So McKenna's car, the Fiesta. Yep. Uh, it's actually an S2000 chassis car. Okay. So that w- those were the NA cars they had for a little while. But this one has been swapped to the 2-liter WRC engine. But we're talking S2000 is the class in the WRC, the, w- the, the rally class. Yes. It was a, when they tried to limit costs, they were doing a 2000 cc so a two liter na car um and then but this one has the engine swapped to a two liter turbo right so it's the lightweight two liter non-turbo chassis with the yeah it's basically a turbo motor in it yeah and it's bigger than the one six turbos it's the two liter so it's from the earlier focus wrc cars so it's fast yeah (laughs) like the marcus grunholm car right um, and then apparently I also heard this on the open ra- on the open paddock rally cast that they had to keep putting ice on the car's ECU because it was overheating and causing a running issue. That's interesting. Yeah. Which I never thought of a car's ECU running so hot that it would cause it to have issues. But to me, it's magic that ECUs even work in the harsh environment of, of a rally a, car, of a, yeah. of a rally car, of an automobile in general. Yeah. Um, but I guess that kind of makes sense because, you know, if you have your phone in your pocket and your phone is doing too many things, it overheats and it has to go into cool-down yeah. mode. So anything that has an ECU in it, I guess, could technically overheat. So before they'd run a stage, they'd throw a bag of ice on it and then they were changing out. Also seems like a bad idea. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess you do what you got to do. Um, but So that was that's the corrections he had for us and then some little extra insight. So thank you, Ryan, for... Yeah, we always appreciate the corrections because... You know, A, we don't like putting false information out there. And B, we certainly Ooh, want to learn, learn some ourselves. more stuff more. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's really cool. And next year, when we go to the rally, we'll know what's going on when they talk about, you know, average speed times and, and all that, that stuff. So mm-hmm. very cool. So uh, what have we done the past couple of weeks? We've had some guests and a qu- uh, less listener question episode. Yep. So we have kind of skipped over a few events that we've done. So we're, do- we're trying to do uh, two a week right now for you guys. Yeah, two episodes a week. So uh, if that seemed like the Monday one might have been a surprise, well, surprise. Yeah, surprise is another Monday one. So, uh, yeah, we're going to do, this is a Monday episode. We're going to do a Thursday and a Monday edition. Yeah, so. we're going to try to keep our Thursday episodes with guests, I think, is kind of kind of be that the... That seems what's the way it's shaking out. Yeah, and then our Monday episode, sometimes that guest will stick around, or sometimes we'll have just a breakdown of stuff that we've been doing because we can't talk about with a guest on. Yep, or listener questions, or... Um, Hopefully, I was planning on coming up with a topic. We haven't done a topic episode in a while. That'll be yeah. kind of fun to yeah, talk about not. one thing. Yeah, but we have a couple of events we've both done the past few weeks, so we have at least some uh, some fresh automotive content. This, yeah, where, where uh, do we go Sunday? Uh, Seacoast Cars and Coffee? Yes. Yeah. Yes, we did. That's the one at Portsmouth. Cinemagic and Cinemagic, Portsmouth. Cinemagic, yeah. yeah. And that's put on by Just One More Cup is the name of the coffee company. Uh-huh. Um, 
not to push a different coffee company because they have no relation to them other than the fact that they host this really good uh, local cars and coffee event. Mm-hmm. Um, small rant I have based on that event, if you wouldn't mind me entering a rant. Oh, no. it's um, No, because um, I stand behind it. A um, couple things. Yep. One, there needs to be a moratorium on free revving your engine because it's gotten out of hand. There's always been one or two people that will sit around free revving their engine. Stephanie said uh, a term from, I guess, it's from being banned, call and answer or something like that. Okay. Like, like somebody would play an instrument. Yes, that did happen. And then in somebody would play it back. High school mm-hmm. marching yeah. band. Yeah. Well, that was the same mentality that was going on at this particular car yeah. show. It was a really good show, really cool cars, some really cool people, but I don't know if it's just the younger crowd or if it's just a uh, mob mentality or what it is, but it was everybody was revving their engines and sitting there and bouncing them off rev limiters, and it needs to stop. It has never occurred to me ever in my entire life. That would be fun to bounce my engine off the rev limiter on purpose. Well, we also drive older cars, and some of our cars don't really have a quote unquote rev limiter. E- well, y- yeah, yours don't. But even when I had newer cars and I was autocrossing, I would always try to avoid right the rev limiter. Yeah, exactly. Because it's like, oh, this is going to a slow me down. Yep. And b, it's not I great. just don't like doing it. No, because you know, you're at, no matter what, you got to be free revving a little bit there. So. Yeah. I, I just I dislike it so much, and it ruins the whole event for me. I mean, I know there's always going to be that one guy that's going to do it. There's always going to be that one guy that's a burnout leaving. But when it becomes the back-and-forth call and response that it was, it was just too much. Um, and small rant with inside a rant. Okay. Um, drones. Yeah. I don't like drones at car shows. No. If If somebody invites you there... As a photographer with a drone, that's okay. If you just show up and think it's okay to fly your own drone, that's not okay. Please stop. And I don't mean to go on rants on the beginning of this podcast and ruin the mood for everybody, but maybe I'm getting too old, but it just frustrates me. A car show is, or Cars and Coffee is a gathering to hang out with like-minded people and just chit-chat about cars, see some cool cars, drink some coffee. And go about your day. It's not somewhere to go where you have to worry about being hit in the head by a flying drone or somebody who doesn't really know what they're doing flying a drone and landing it on the hood of your freshly painted car yeah. or whatever else can happen. Because, you know, it's just a respect thing, I think. It shouldn't be there. No, it's so. fine to, like, walk around, take pictures. Yeah, video, exactly. But uh, drones are a little dicey. It's a little over the top, I think. Yeah. Anyway, moving on to the show itself. So rant over it was a really good show otherwise yes any highlights for you Andrew? is uh, shoot is this coming weekend the N- salem new hampshire one i think it's the 27th so it's okay. a week two weeks three weeks away three weeks away so terrible for not looking this up first i know i saw a post about it on facebook earlier yeah i'm pretty sure it's three weeks away all right so i'll you look that up and i'll go into my project car updates Mine are a little bit longer, I think. Oh, sure. Uh, before we get into project car updates, did you have anything uh, anything stood out for you at the uh, Cars and Coffee? Oh, uh, really the thing, my favorite thing was that uh, Scout that showed up. The Scout 2? The white Scout with the cutaway doors? Yeah, the Baja doors and the bikini top. Yep, that was really cool. And, and like period the, correct the graphics. gold and black like leaf stripes. Yes, that, that, was, a, that was super cool. cool. Uh, there's that first-gen Mini. That thing's pretty cool. Yep, that's actually owned by one of the organizers of the Southern New Hampshire Cars mm-hmm. and Coffee, Maylin. Um, super nice person. Super cool for her to get that car. She's wanted for a oh. long time. And then the, was it a 49 Buick? Uh, Buick Roadmaster. Yeah. Convertible. Yeah, like the uh, Rain Man car. Yeah. But blue. Oh, man. That car was like a concourse car. Uh, August 20th is the next um, Southern New Hampshire Cars So you and might be at, well, you'll probably be at MOD. I might be at MOD. If I'm not, maybe I'll go over there. Yeah. Check it out anyway if you're local to the area. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't I don't think we'll be there, but obviously we don't make the car show, so yep. go. <laughs> There's a beautiful E-Type. Yep, park right next to that Roadmaster, yep. actually. Uh, oh, that Nissan, the Pulsar GTI? GTI-R. GTI-R. Yeah, which is the like baby GTR, pretty much. Mm-hmm. Really cool car. Well, it's an SR20. Yep, SR20 Turbo, Turbo all-wheel drive. All-wheel drive. Nissan, is that a... It's like um, a Primera-based... Yeah, it's the same or nose as a G20. Yeah. yeah, but I'm trying to think what the... 
I keep going to Starlip as a Toyota. So a Pulsar, yeah, Nissan Pulsar, Pulsar. Yeah. yeah. It's a little hatchback. Well, be uh, in the four door version was a Premiera. Yes, which yeah. I sold in this country as a G20. G20. So it had the coolest grill ever with the integrated fog lights, which mm-hmm. kind of made me want to buy a G20. I think of what else add was those there. Fog lights. Oh, next to it was like a first gen RT10 Viper, white with blue stripes. Yes, so with white wheels, white car, blue stripes, and a blue steering wheel. Yeah, it was pretty. It was pretty terrible, but pretty awful at the same time. Oh, I'd rock it. Uh, sorry, pretty terrible, pretty awesome at the same time. Yeah. That was a really cool car. And the I liked the, there was a Volkswagen Dasher that was slammed on the ground yep. and stanced out, but it was a Dasher, so it was cool. What uh, what was that long wagon, that giant wagon you liked? Oh, it was like a 66 or a 67 Plymouth. I don't know if it was a Fury or It what. was like 25 feet long. It was huge. It was ridiculous. We'll put some pictures up of the event so you can know some of the cars we're chatting about here because... You know, you sit here and describe cars all you want all day long, but nobody... I only took, like, pictures of the Scout, because I was like... Mm. I have pictures of a few cars. I can... Sometimes you know. I just get, like, eh, I just want to walk around and enjoy it. Yeah, of course. Of course. And there was that guy that uh, parked next to you with his uh, Evo cologne. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you had the Gallant, and the guy pulled in in, a, like, an Evo 5 clone, or an Evo 6, Evo 5. Yeah. It was probably, obviously, it was a Mirage or the body kit, but it was pretty well done. You know, at first glance... If you didn't notice it was left-hand yeah. drive, you would have thought it was an Evo. So, But anyway, that's a really good show. i um, not sure the next one of those is, but that's called Seacoast, uh, Seacoast Coast. Cars and Coffee. Um, free coffee, free show. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's totally worth going up there for. And uh, if you do go and you have a, pre- a, a tendency to rev your engine, please don't. And if you see somebody doing it, just yell at them because I know next time I'm going to start yelling at people. Get, right. us, get us thrown out of there. Yeah. Just, just, it just ruins it, man. It does. It's going to ruin the show for everybody. Um, one other event we did, I did do a off-road trip. Oh, yeah. Um, two weekends ago with the Northeast Mitsubishi 4x4 crew. We did a uh, two-night camping and two days of wheeling. Um, really good time. Roads in Vermont are by far my favorite off-road driving roads that I've ever been on now. Mm-hmm. Because they're fairly technical without being really rocky. So it's pretty easy on the equipment. Yeah, I wasn't going to say they're mel- they're not well maintained. No, that's, uh, that's not no. the right word for it. They're, they're primitive. They're, they're primitive roads, but yeah. they're well documented. Yes. That's what yeah, I want to say. You can, you can find them easily. Yes. We did um, some research, yeah. Yeah, well, if you know who to talk to, you can find the roads. And honestly, they're all mapped out, even on Google Maps. They, you okay. can see them. They're just, you got to figure out which ones you can go down and which ones you can't go down. Yep. Some of them are really narrow because they're designed for, you know, the single track, like a, like a dirt bike trail. Mm-hmm. So if you get stuck on one of those, which we did, unfortunately, um, as a navigating error that we made, <laughs> you wind up getting stuck pretty good and you have to get off of them. But there's some amazing scenery up there. Um, I think we're going to try to do another off-road trip up there and maybe we'll open it up to a few more, a few more people when we do it next time. Well, we have VOR so, coming up. Yep, VOR is coming. That's actually where a lot of the roads came from, from last year's VOR. That's where they got the information from. That'll be the from, so. third weekend. That's the 29th of September, I believe. Yeah. So that's all I, know it's, I know it's after your wedding, so. Yes, by design. Yes. <laughs> so project car updates, Andrew. What do you have? Uh, so I've been driving the 99 around Montero. Yep. Uh, I finally, I've been using a little Bluetooth speaker because the radio was dead. Like dead, dead. Yeah, just didn't turn on nothing. Um, I said the other week I bought a head unit. Um, it was actually eighty bucks. Kenwood with a CD and Bluetooth. A CD what now? Has yeah, <laughs> Bluetooth and a charging USB port in the front and an That's aux port. Pretty damn convenient to have a charging USB port on the deck. Uh, and it's, it's probably common now, but I haven't bought a radio in so yeah, many years. Yeah, and it's like it's, well. It's like this really simple design. It actually looks like really nice in the truck. It's not like some radios are kind of gaudy looking. This is like real simple. You can adjust the colors. Uh, it sounds really good because the truck has a factory Infinity sound system. And I'd use a special adapter harness to wire it into the amp. Uh, excuse me. And of all the old Mitsubishis I've ever owned, it sounds the best because it came with Infinity speakers and not... Mitsubishi pa- paper paper, paper cone yeah. speakers, which is Mitsubishi ironic because paper Mitsubishi makes decent electronics. They make really stereos. good high end audio. Yeah, but they put crappy radios in their cars. Yeah, 
that everything else I've replaced the speakers with, but this sounds really good. Yeah, no, it does. I was surprised how well, how, how good it sounded just with the yeah. stock speakers in it. Uh, I put my bubble visors on, and the driver's side one has caused a wind noise because I didn't get the <laughs> inside weather strip seated quite right. I got to take a plastic trim tool and. Bubble visors are like um, vent visors, but bigger. Yeah. So they're kind of like an Australian style. Yeah, they're kind of halfway between an Australian style and a bigger American style. Vent visor style one. But they were pretty, they installed super easy, and I think they look really cool. They do look cool. So, and then. Plus it allows you to rip butts in the truck with the windows down a little bit. Yeah, not that I do that. But (laughs) actually, I can can put down the driver's window without putting down the rear windows, and my hair doesn't get messy. And it doesn't cut. Does it still cause the wind buffeting, or is the wind buffeting no, gone? So gone. That's, that's key. That's what I hate about most four door cars. Yeah, you got to put the rear window down. Thing. One window down, you get a wicked buffeting in the headline. Because that's the other thing. Now I have to figure out for some weird reason, both rear window motors and regulators are like slowing way down and barely go up, barely go down. Probably just grease the tracks. I've cleaned the run channels. I've greased the uh, window regulator. Uh, I've made sure the doors were straight, like the frame wasn't bent. Okay. And I don't know if they're just both on their way out. That's weird. But they decided at the same time just to go. Yeah, one was slow, and now they're both slow. So hmm. I got to pull some uh, pull as in question some other Montero people and see what they think. Yeah. Maybe, and then maybe uh, I just need to replace them, or maybe I, there's can something Can you replace else the missing. motor separately, or do you have to replace the whole? I have to look at it. I can look at them. Factory service manual. Yeah. That's annoying. That's a cause it's of an old car. It, it's only annoying because when I put Enzo in the back, I like to put the windows down for him. Yeah. And, then you and they'll go up. down and then they'll barely go back up. So Honestly, the passenger side window in my Silverado is like that. The yeah. passenger's front. Well, so I usually a, wind up putting it like halfway down. That's a Chevy. So. Yeah. <laughs> I don't I don't disagree with you there. Um, what else did I do? Oh, do you remember the pa- driver's seat was like really squeaky? I don't remember that. So without the radio, it, like going down Bouncy Roads, the driver's seat was like, rear, 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 like just kept squeaking. And I was like, well, maybe there's springs inside here. So I took it out. There's no springs inside the seat because it's foam. Mm-hmm. And it's it's a power seat. So there's a bunch of levers and screw jacks that move the seat back and forth and up and down. Mm-hmm. And so I had it on the ground. I put my shoulder into it and basically like leaned into it and like bounced it and started to get to squeak and figured out that. The entire base is assembled of, like, sheet metal plates that are bolted together. And they were loose? They weren't. Maybe they're loose. I actually didn't check them. They were pretty tight, I assume, because, like, the seat doesn't move. No. So uh, I actually took, I have this really fancy uh, lubricating spray that I liberated from a old job. And you spray it. It comes out liquid. And then within, like, 20 seconds, it turns to gel. That's weird. So it doesn't drip everywhere. So I sprayed it. At the seams of these plates, so it, it f- like flowed down in between the plates, mm-hmm. and then it gelled up, and I was like pushing into it, and the squeak went away. Hmm. So now it goes down the road. There's no squeak noise. Now, now there's just a rattle in the dash I got to find. And I'm, it, I'm glad I've only had one small glass of this uh, scotch. Yeah, because there were some really inappropriate jokes that could come from that whole conversation about lube and pushing it jamming it down in there and oh, whatever turning into a gel so i'm glad we stopped that one before it got too far whatever <laughs> uh so it's amazing how eliminating some small squeaks like made the truck seem totally it greatly more improves solid the, yeah. all, the whole overall driving experience of yeah, the vehicle you can eliminate i remember when i was a kid um my father would be driven absolutely bonkers by a rattle in a vehicle to the point where he would pretty much gut the interior trying to find it. Oh, I get like that too. Yeah, he's though he was like it's super annoying. He was super bad about it. And when you get in somebody else's car and it's rattling and they don't fix it, like how does it not annoy you? Yeah, I remember he had a like the OJ body style Bronco. Yeah, but like the slightly different headlights. I think his was an eighty nine or a ninety, and there was a rattle that he could never quite pick up on, um, and he wound up pulling the headliner out of the truck, and it was the outer skin and inner skin of the roof. Was what was rattling. The glue had let go. Oh. And that was causing the rattle. All right. And it was so faint that you could barely hear it, but he knew it was there and it drove him so insane he pulled the headliner out to fix it. <laughs> I've got something. I thought it was the da- I thought it was the glove box bouncing. So I opened the glove box while I was driving. I put my hand on it, drove over some bumps, and it was still making the noise. 
So I th- think it's over towards the passenger side near where the speaker is up in the dash. So maybe the speaker's a little loose or something. So mm, the pause in there and look. Does it does it get worse when your base hits? Nope. Okay. No. <laughs> maybe no. not the speaker then. No, it's just over bumps. Like it's a little rattle. Mm, that's okay. interesting. So whatever. Uh, my 31 inch tires showed up. Kind of. Yeah, I had to go to FedEx to get them, which is fine because they all fit in my truck. So I hope to have those installed by next week. Yeah, that'll be nice because your truck kind of has that, you know, yes. little wimpy look to it with skipped, the smaller tires on skipped it. Skipped leg day. I wasn't going to make the obvious joke, but yes, the, the yeah. skipped leg day look. Which is funny because they look really good on the 89, but for some reason they don't the work. The wheel wells that. just must be so much larger on the 99 that it looks yep they look lost down there yeah uh and then those wheels will go back on the 89 and the 89 is for sale i haven't fixed the radiator yet but if you want to still purchase it i am planning on fixing the radiator yes but that truck will be up for sale twenty nine hundred dollars yeah. uh, other than the radiator it's running great and it will run fine it will run fine like 20 minutes a day. yeah because the radiator just has a small leak at the moment so you could drive it as is and that can be negotiated. But uh, for now, I plan on fixing it. Uh, and then... we we'll to Auto Off Topic. Automotive sales. Hey. This Monday edition. Whatever. <laughs> uh, I also ordered a single-din CB radio to go underneath for my... For the 99? For the 99 to fit in the opening that was under my single-din stereo. Was the original radio a double-din? Or did it have a pocket? It had a double-din opening with a pocket. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. I did not realize that. Mitsubishi did that a lot in the 90s, though. So You get either or. Yeah, a lot of them had a, like a CD player uh, this, separate. Yeah, this one had just a cassette deck and then a tennis changer in the back. Okay, so that's like my Talon had a cassette deck, and then below it was in a single DIN, was just a standalone CD player. Yeah, and then my Talon didn't come with the CD player option. It had the graphic equalizer. Right, which was, is actually kind of cooler. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the way my Galant was option was the graphic equalizer at the but bottom. But that was in a single double den unit, though, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. And th- but they you could you get two versions, and there was one that had a, a the CD version too. Oh, okay, I didn't realize that. Yeah. So weird. But anyway, obscure Mitsubishi stereos, deep Mitsubishi knowledge. Also, there's one there's one particular one you can get a double den out of a 3000 GT with an aux port. With it has an aux port on it, factories. which is very rare for the 90s. Yeah. And actually, even my Talon one that I bring up, it was pretty rare to have a factory CD player because the car was a 1990. Yeah. So. I got to pull that tendus changer out of the back now because it takes up like. A huge amount of cargo area. <laughs> not a huge amount, but it could amount where you could put something Tools, useful. something yeah. in there. Yeah. And then it's got, uh, it's weird when you're in there, there's the plug for that. And then there's two antenna plugs. So there's one in your normal antenna. Mm-hmm. And then there's one for like an auxiliary antenna in the back window. But for what purpose? An I FM antenna? Maybe. I don't know. Or an AM antenna? I don't know. The factory radio had two antenna ports. The new one does not. It only has the standard size antenna. So you had to figure out which one was the correct one to use? Or well, no. One? one is much bigger. It's the standard size, like, hmm. antenna port. I wonder what the other one is for, then. It's strange. a strange thing. Yeah. Is it like a signal booster for something? Or Who knows? That's, that's bizarre. Then i got to figure out the antenna is broken. Which is fine. You can get a new one, and it's probably the cable inside that broke. But the um, the way I had to wire the radio, it only had one power wire in the adapter harness, and I spliced in the power wire. It said to put to the en- the amp to turn it on, or there was one that was like power the antenna. So I spliced the two and I spliced the three of them together. Okay, because I wasn't sure. Which was which? Which was no, I, I knew which was which, but I wasn't. I was like, well, I don't know if the antenna will work if I use the tuner, but I thought maybe some radios, if you turn it to tuner, the antenna will go up, and we switch it to some other mode, the antenna will go we'll down, go back down again. Yeah. But I think right now it runs all the time. We'll put the antenna up. So to whenever the radio's on, the antenna goes up. Yeah. Which actually I like better because I hate it when the antenna keeps going up and down because to me those antennas always have a finite life schedule, like life. Life expectancy, yeah, and uh, I'm always afraid that I'm gonna break it. Well, see, that's the thing the with the the Glant has the power antenna, but I have it set. That radio will only put it up when you turn it to tuner, oh, okay. so it never. I never use the tuner in it, so, so it always never down. goes up. Mm-hmm. So, well, I know, like I had what vehicle had a power antenna? Um, I don't even remember which car it was. I had that had a power antenna. Oh, the Saab has a power antenna. Um, and it would bother me 
that every time I turned the car on, the antenna would go up, yeah. regardless of where I had the radio set before. And I tried really hard to figure out how to make it so that the antenna wouldn't go up when you turned the car on, but I couldn't figure out a way to do it. I might, I, I might just, just want it to happen. I might just disable it because it's... You don't really use the radio anymore. I don't really use the radio, and it's like if you're going down a trail or... I don't think you'll get much wind noise in the highway with it, but the antenna's just in the way on a trail. It's definitely Especially in the way on a power trail. Antenna. Yeah. You can't be like bent out of the way no. when a tree branch hits it. Exactly. It'll yeah. just break. But nine times out of ten, you probably have the radio shut off anyways because you're using the CB. Yep. Yep. So you're concentrating a little more. You don't need music. We'll see. Even when I was doing the off-road trip in Vermont with my Silverado, I did not have a CB, but I let the radio off because you're kind of like yeah. you're concentrating a lot more on what you're doing, and the radio is more of a distraction. That is a whip antenna on it? It's a standard, yeah, standard metal yeah. antenna. It bent back when the tree branched it. That always worries me because a whip antenna can whip back and shatter, shatter a windshield. windshield. Yeah, my windshield's already shattered anyway, so okay. it's fine. Plus, right. I don't plan on using the truck off road all the time. So yeah. So anyway, that's what I've got for cars. I one more time, once again, have not done anything. No, yes, you did. You have the coal to run. Yeah, but it's overheating again, so I'm just gonna. Burn it in the woods, I think, is the next plan. Well, not, no, but you figured not, out what the leak was. Not really. It was a bad... It was, it was, the, it was the petcock. <laughs> yeah. It's always embarrassing to say I didn't drive the car for four days because I wasn't paying attention yeah. to it. I was like, oh, it's leaking. I don't feel like dealing with it. Well, you know, the one on the Montero was leaking, too. The 99. The petcock was? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's all it was, was the petcock. Um, a lot of the threads had just stripped out of it over the years. And yeah. the rubber seal was just was just gone, and just it was dripping pretty good. You'd fill it, and by the next morning, it would be empty. So it was just a petcock. I went to Pep Boys to buy the new one because they showed it in stock via the part number. Mm. Uh, the Dor- it was like a Dorman Universal Aftermarket one because the package said that it fit Toyota, Mazda, Mitsubishi, Ford, and Dodge from like 1971, 1998. <laughs> hmm. So they figured they'd have it in stock, and they had it in stock, but the guy there didn't know what he was looking for, so... I scoured the store and found out, you know, showed him how to find the parts that he has in stock. Yeah. Um, paid a couple bucks for it, is all it was, and that took care of the problem. But the overheating problem has come right back again, which was gone for a little while. So I'm not even sure where to go with that anymore. I'm just... You got um, to take the radio out and just have it yeah, rotted or whatever. Because the, the, the coolant that's in it is black again, too. So it was clear for for a long time. It ran great for like a week, and now it's just black and overheating again. I actually drove it here tonight, um, and on the highway, it started getting really hot. So I pulled off the highway and came back roads, and mm-hmm. just not not a wonderful feeling. You know, it was working so good for so long. I'd take it to Maine, it's, and it was it's, fine. It's overheating at highway speed? Yes. It's not an airflow issue. Nope. It's a water flow issue. Yeah. So it's... Something's clogged somewhere, and it's for a while it doesn't do it, and then maybe there's some some kind of sediment in there that's just uh, sometimes it's in the right place where enough water can go by, or yeah. there's a big giant chunk of rust in there that clogs a passageway somewhere every now and again. I, I don't know, but I can't get it out, so I'm gonna have to pull a radiator out again mm-hmm. and uh, send it out and have it taken care of. So hopefully, I mean I can't. But can't be too much else left for it, so... Then you just have to make sure you bleed it. Yeah, which is easy enough on that car. I don't even have a thermostat in it right now, so the fact that it's overheating without a thermostat in it means it's definitely overheating, so... And I... You know, a couple people have said, maybe it's just your gauge is reading wrong, but when it starts getting hot, the car gets pretty... Does it smell hot? It smells hot, but they always smell hot because it's an old carbureted Colt. Yeah, Um, the engines give off, like, a... You can tell when they're too hot. It runs a little sluggish. Yeah. And it will, you know, when it gets really hot, if I haven't pulled off the highway in time, when you hit the gas, it'll diesel a little bit. So you know it's too hot. There's, yeah. some, there's something going on. So it's definitely the gauge is functioning perfectly fine. It's just something else isn't functioning perfectly fine. And I'm getting a little frustrated because, you know, we live in New England, and it gets really hot here in the summertime. Hot you know? and humid. Yeah, it's, it's just hot and gross. <laughs> so it's 90 degrees out with an 85% humidity, and, you know, the car is going to run pretty hot, so... I got to figure it out. I'll get there eventually. Um, as of this recording date, I'm still waiting for my valve stem seals for the Montero. Mm-hmm. That uh, on our last podcast, our last episode, 
um, Josh from Adventure Driven Designs was giving me fits about changing that to the turbo motor for my Starion. Mm-hmm. But I'm still going to try to go ahead and fix the, the radiator when those parts come in. So as of the recording date, they have not come in yet. I'm hoping that by the time this goes live, they'll be here and they'll be installed and the truck will be running beautifully and the coat will be all fixed and life will be all roses and unicorns. So let's hope so, but I don't really expect that to be the case, unfortunately. So um, I haven't worked on any of my other cars because I'm a lazy bum. Mm -hmm. They're all broken and haven't touched them. Oh, we figured out what was wrong with Joe's Forester. And the tumble valve. This is the Forester XT that we talked yeah. previously about doing um, head, gaskets. head gasket and intake valve. Yeah. Yeah. The tumble valve gasket, the tumble valve sensor on the bank to so the driver's side is bad. Now, what is a tumble valve? Apparently in the intake, at cold start, it closes down the intake runner to help increase air velocity cause a tumbling effect and better mixture okay and better like lower emissions at idle cold okay. start easier cold start i guess okay and then it uh it's supposed to let it like once it's running it just opens up that valve so it's based on like heat probably it's, it's basically a throttle position sensor it just needs to know where this this valve plate is okay and it was giving a low circuit code and when we finally looked at the wiring diagrams with my dad and then figured out which wire was which, there was no sig- there was signal or there was no connection between the 5-volt signal and the ground. So that it was just dead. With it's within the switch itself, within, you mean? Within the, sen- yeah. the sensor. Switch. So the wiring was all good, but the switch was yeah, dead. Because you checked the wiring at both ends of the harness and all the wires yeah. were complete. Right? And all continuity, yeah. Yeah, so you want the next thing was it had to be inside the part itself. Yeah. So... Then we borrowed one from Jordan's STI Shh, that we had on hand. I told, told Jordan. Larry. Oh, okay. Uh, and that... To be, to be fair, we didn't call Jordan and ask, but he was also camping outside of cell phone service. Yeah, he, he, so. I'm pretty sure it would have been fine with that. I know. I'm just... <laughs> anyway, we took that sensor off. He tested it. Had uh, continuity or resistance between the 5 volts and the ground like it should. But it still didn't work. No, it did work. It still didn't work. Not the first time. It's oh that's right because uh, he didn't clock it right as I put right. it in. Yeah, well, you, had, you had to set it right when you put it in. You couldn't just yeah. put it in and, and use it. You had to make sure it was at the right position. Yeah. So then it's um, that worked. And yeah, the this is a part went. that we're completely unfamiliar with because it's only a Subaru part. Well, and apparently you have to buy it as a whole tumbler valve assembly to get that part. So then Joe looked up. Uh, the part online, what people had done, and there was a part number in the form, so we bought it off eBay. And actually, I got a message tonight that he put it in, the light went away, and then it came back on with the light. So Maybe it's just not clocked right again? It's either that. I did show him how to do it, but it was tricky. Mm -hmm. Um, I can go look at it. Or I know someone who just got a Forester XT that is using it for parts for their other Forester XT, so maybe I can buy the sensor off them cheaply. Oh, okay. That'd be cool. Yeah. So. I don't see why the one he bought wouldn't be perfectly fine, though. No. I'll I'll double check it for him first. Yeah. And just help him out. But it's that's it's definitely a bad sensor. You just need to. Yeah. There's no question. Yeah. Because he put the good one in from Jordan's car. Yeah. And once it was clocked in the right position. Yeah. It, it worked, worked perfectly yeah, fine. Perfectly. Drove the car on the but block. But then the car has a developed a vibration. Yep. And uh, I ordered a magnet mount for my GoPro so we can put it underneath the car and see if it's the drive shaft. I personally think it's the... It's undiagnosed yet. I personally think it's the center bearing. Mm -hmm. Uh, It didn't seem like it had a lot of play when I inspected it. Nothing else had much play. But when I looked at a couple different cars on the lifts, their carrier bearings did not move nearly as much when I pushed on them. Okay. Because compared to his. And like like Jordan's STI was in the lift afterwards. Yeah, it was really tight. Okay. So I think what happened was the car sat in the driveway on, yeah, on, for a on while. grass yeah. for a couple of weeks while we were working on the engine. And it rained. It was, you know, we get humidity here. And the e-brakes locked up. Mm-hmm. So Joe was having an issue with the e-brake locking up. And I think doing that and then trying to break it free 
so over torqued the drive shaft. Right, because the rear end wasn't moving, and the engine was trying to turn the drive shaft. And the only place it moved is right in the middle of the carrier bearing. Yeah, the carrier bearing. Yeah, that would make sense. And then Joe has done the brakes, so the e-brake is not sticking anymore. But the I think now the carrier bearing is busted. It was the That's you are my, the weakest link. Goodbye. Yeah, yeah, that makes that makes sense. That that is now my working theory that I want to investigate. So, but next week we'll be able to tell you if it was it that yeah. it was that or not. But we're not sure. So, and I think putting so, the putting the GoPro under there and then driving it and hopefully having it vibrate, we should be able to see. If not, it'll make for an interesting video. Yeah, if it does something. Yeah. So Maybe if it doesn't do anything, it'll be an interesting video to see the two piece drive shaft and. Any kind of flex that it might have anyway. There's a ton of flex in the transmission mount, but it's not broken. There's a mm-hmm. ton of flex in the diff mounts, but they're not broken. They're just soft they're bushings soft, yeah. for vibration. Yeah, for NVH compliance. Yeah. So yeah, the only other place is in that so single... stay tuned for next week. We'll know if the tumbler valve was fixed, if that piece was fixed, and if the Raider does not smoke oil smoke anymore. Yeah. So... Andrew, I think this is the first and last time I will go with the uh, Belvini whiskey. Uh, that really gets that bad? Um, it made it a little more difficult to uh, to complete a sentence here without slurring oh, my I words should, um, a little bit. I guess I drink it too often then. <laughs> yeah, possibly. It was delicious. It's really good. Yeah. What did you say? We were portraying a 14-year a aged. This is a, yeah, it was a birthday gift. It's a Caribbean cask, the 14-year Belvini single malt. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah, so it's like... Normally we drink a lighter beer on the podcast. <laughs> well, we only have like a... You drink like a tiny bit. Yeah. Straight up. No ice, no nothing. Like no. the way you're supposed to. No, it's delicious. It's, I'd, um, I'd like to drink more of it, but... It's aged like seven years. And then they used, for the second seven years, I, I recall correctly, it's aged in barrels that used to contain rum. So you get that little bit of a rum flavor. Sweet flavor along mm-hmm. with the with the scotch yeah. flavor. It's... Absolutely delicious. It's one of my favorites. Yeah, so. it's absolutely yeah. delicious. If you have the means, I highly recommend one. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's pretty reasonable for what it yeah. is. No, it's really good. Anyway, yeah, that's uh, just a side note. It might not be that. It might just be that it's getting kind of late and I'm getting a little overtired. But mm. it definitely, yeah, uh, definitely did not hit me the way I expected it to. Well, with that, let's wrap this one up. Yep. And you can always find the Auto Off Topic Podcast on Facebook, Auto Off Topic Podcast. You can find our Instagram, Auto Off Topic. You can find me on Instagram, Raced in Anger. You can find me on Instagram at TSISS350. That's right. You can find my business page at Vintage Imports New England on Facebook and Instagram. Yes. And uh, keep your cars analog. Don't forget to check out Z28 The Band. Oh, right. Uh, on their Bandcamp site and at Nobody Rides for Free on Facebook. All right. <laughs>